Kia Mai Hub. Tonight we're going to be continuing our songwriting sessions, and tonight we've got three amazing guests on the panels. Tonight we've got Tom Golly, we've got Kerwai Williams, and we've got Edwin Brown. Now these three gentlemen are all prolific songwriters, have done things for many, many years. So we're going to catch up on some of the styles and some of the ways that they do their writing. Maybe that'll encourage you. My name is Dale Borland, and I'm Cheryl Duick. I'm just going to tell you a little bit that uh, that that's very special about these guys. Um, first of all, what's special is we're not just we're not just extracting them from Canada. We've got Kiroi from from Toronto, from Toronto, Ontario. But we've also went all the way to Nashville and got Tom Golly. And we didn't stop there. We went all the way to Northern Ireland and got Edwin. So you are going to get an around the world perspective on songwriting, specifically about lyric writing. I'll tell you a little bit more about these guys. Let's start with Kiroi. Let's start from our hometown here. Kiroi um, has got a big fan base. He's from. <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> he is the writer. He's a member of the Toronto Mass Choir. He is one of their key songwriters for their for their music. And he's also had opportunity to, to write for other artists such as Pat Russell, Londa Larmond, and a few others that, that are from the Toronto area. He's had he's been in the business for or been writing for 13 years, and he has had opportunity to sing or per, perform, write for the Rom, Roy Thompson Hall, Toronto Jazz Festival, CBC. He's gone around the world. He's been very successful. Welcome, Kiroi. Thank you for Hi, being Cheryl, here. Hi, Cheryl. How are you? We also have Tom Golly. We're heading towards Nashville now. And Tom Golly is a Christian singer-songwriter. He was born and raised in Long Island, New York, but he currently lives in Nashville. Since 2010, he's been songwriting. He's immersed himself in music. And he is popular for songs. Uh, well, his first one was Not Going Back. But I know him for songs like His Name is Jesus um, and Fighting for Us. And there's a few others that I know, but welcome, Tom. We'll talk more about those. Welcome, Tom. Oh, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. And last but not least, Edwin at midnight. We yeah. have to give props <laughs> to you, Edwin. Yeah. Ed Edwin is tuning in all the way from Northern Ireland. He is one of Northern Ireland's accomplished composers, musicians, vocalists, and worship leaders, and songwriter. Um, he's been writing since the age of 18. And he's had opportunity to not only write, but sing, lead worship in many different countries and for many different audiences, including royalty. He's performed for the queen, <laughs> for the queen of England. He's uh, performed for the prime minister of Kenya. And he has so many other accolades that I can write down, but or to speak. But I just want to say welcome, Edwin. <laughs> Thank you for uh, being here. It's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you for inviting me. Very cool. So right. we wanted to start with, um, with, with, we're here to talk about songwriting. We're here to talk specifically about lyric writing. So I'm just going to pose this question to you. When I say lyric writing, what does that mean to you? And you can. Words, that's the first thing that um, comes to mind, words, um, and what you want to accomplish with them. Okay. I think that's my first thought process when I hear lyric writing. Uh, I, I would say I think more about, um, you know, lyric writing. It's like, what, what, what message are you trying to convey? You know, what, what do you want someone to take away from it? Um, you know, I mean, it, it's got to go deeper than just trying to be cute with a couple of certain phrases or bending a couple of vowels to make something sound interesting. Like, <laughs> it's more about what you say than how you say it. I believe that's important. So that's what lyric writing is to me, is, is writing something impactful and real and powerful that conveys a message or tells a story as opposed to just, you know, wow, a cool way to say that. Yeah. Well, I, I have to agree with uh, both uh, Tom and Karoi. I mean, for me to add to that, I think, just as you said, I think when we write songs, we've got to be authentic. Uh, we've got to be honest about what we write. And um, I, I, I like to try and write simply. Uh, try to avoid big, long, lengthy lyrics. Trying to keep it, keep it simple, and to think about what I'm trying to convey, what I'm trying to say, 
uh, not always looking for a rhyme or a rhythmic pattern, mm -hmm. uh, but just getting words on a page uh, and then taking it from there, really. And there's some people that take the lyrics um, and maybe th that that's a priority. And there may be some people that their 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 music is their priority. They want to have the music yeah. be the thing. And then there's there's the, there's a the person who wants to do the choreography, like they wants to do the the arrangement and that to them is the, I, I mean there's a there's a blending of the three but what would you say that is is, is a priority for you when it comes to writing a song is it that you you play a piano and all of a sudden the words or you write the words and then you work on the or how does that work for you is that is that for me that's for any one of you <laughs> well um I think I think there's no prescriptive way for me um, because I, I play piano sometimes when I'm playing the piano sometimes a mel 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 melody can't even say the words like the melody will come or there'll be a, a certain pattern of music that I like uh, and from that I'll, I'll find inspiration for lyrics sometimes I like to write poems or I like to write prayers so that the lyrics come forward. So I, I would always say, don't judge yourself. Don't force it. Uh, don't, don't be too hard on yourself. You know, start the process by, by doing what makes you feel most creative. If you're a musician, if you play guitar, if you play a piano, go to your instrument. Um, find a quiet time. Find a quiet time to reflect, particularly if it's a, if it's a Christian song, a worship song. Think about certain, certain aspects of the Christian walk or who God is. And um, maybe from the, the melody line, I'll find lyrics that will fit into that particular um, tune that I'm playing. But other times I'll, I'll write words down, words that have meant something to me, maybe something that I heard or I read. Uh, and I'll play around with the words. And maybe there'll have no real structure at the start because I want to make sure that what I'm trying to say, people will understand. And then from that, sometimes I'll just um, play around with Go to the piano and play around with chords and try and work that way. So for me, it just depends. Yes, but you you hit on a perfect uh, note. I was thinking about poetry is something that it's a good way to introduce yourself to the lyricist concept. Um, the reading poetry may not be your thing. Creating poetry may not be your thing. But when you're writing a song, you want to be in that poetic mindset. And yeah, definitely practicing your poetry is a great way to start. Is that how that works for you, Tom, and you, Kuroi? Is that how that works for you? Well, back when I was just starting to songwrite, poetry was, I think, my gateway in. <laughs> so I find it interesting. I don't think about it that way anymore, but it was my gateway into starting to write songs. And I've got to say, I threw out a couple of them back then. But um, definitely what resonated with what Edwin said was the times of meditation and prayer. Um, the quiet times um, and pulling from those moments of intimate worship or from just meditating on something somebody said. For example, a song I wrote recently, it literally, I logged on to Facebook. I, I, I was uh, in songwriting mode then. So you kind of prepare your mind to say, okay, and you, you med you're meditating and all that. I logged on to Facebook. I saw a guy, he was doing a devotion, but his shirt said forgiven. And I just shut it off immediately because that triggered the process for me. Just that word on his shirt. That became your muse. And all of a sudden you're like, I got it. I got you. Yeah, that, that's what it was. And it sparked an entire song. So um, I think to Edwin's point, it's, you know, no rhyme or reason necessarily. It's just that trigger or that, that bit of inspiration that gets everything going wherever it's from. A word, a phrase, a devotion, mm -hmm. uh, just being quiet whatever it is. How about you, Tom? So uh, I have an interesting admission here, I, and I'm probably the only one in this uh, group to uh, probably have this be true, but I've actually never written a song all by myself. Uh, I firmly believe in co-writing. I believe yeah. that the best songs are co-written. Um, and it's just like a chef. A chef will tell you that the best foods have multiple ingredients. You know, because different ingredients complement each other, sometimes negate each other, and it's always for the best. So I find that the, there's such a beauty in the co-writing process because it, never, it almost never gets stale. You know, you can get, you know, people can get, in my opinion, it's kind of like, for me, 
if you know me long enough, you've probably heard every one of my stories. You're kind of tired of them, right? But if, you know, now what happens is you start figuring out what's the best story in the room to tell, what's the best idea in the room. And what's great is you got two other people who are very good at what they do, who have a different point of view on maybe a, a, a feeling or a topic, and you end up with something way deeper than you would have gotten yourself. Also, mm. you get somebody else to go, dude, that is cheesy. When you're like, but it was the best idea ever. So right. they might have saved you thousands of dollars in production <laughs> costs by going, mm, I think we could beat that line. So uh, for me, it's always been co-writing, building relationships with people, and um, just being able to um, just go into everything, holding on very, very loosely uh, and not cling too tight to an idea, but also not marry an idea so much to where um, – you know, you, you end up right, like forcing something that just doesn't need to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like uh, the co-writing process for me has always allowed for the best songs to be written. And it's, it's amazing because a perfect example is my, my latest single is a song called I'm Letting Go. And I came in with the first verse written. I'm like, hey, so I wrote the first verse, man. I'm like, you know, I, I don't really write songs alone. And he looks at it and goes, nah, that's the chorus. And I'm like, it is? <laughs> and you know what? He's right. Wow, we got a chorus. That's why I co-write. because, the, And it, it's one of my favorite songs that I've written so far. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, for me, co-writing, co-writing, co-writing all day, hands down. Yeah. Two heads are better than one. I get that. Three, four, five. Yeah, four, or, yeah. <laughs> or if you do secular pop music, 16 is 16. better than one. Well, yeah. <laughs> Changing everything. Yeah, it's true. So, Tom, I do have to ask. I do have to ask. Um, I know when we were during COVID, um, I think you were doing some some live live uh, performances, and there was a gal beside you singing with you. I think her name was Jennifer Chamberlain. Is she yeah. one of your co-writers as well, or no? Yeah, Jennifer's um, Jennifer's uh, a really really cool story uh, that's still developing, and it's awesome. Um, you know, Jennifer's an artist that I had met. Um, I played at her church a couple of times, uh, but I'd met her a number of years ago and, and just, you know, something special. It's like, well, you know, you meet a person, you just go, you have a story, you know, and it's just like, well, and they start telling you the story because you told them, I think you have a story and you're like, wow, people need to hear that. And because of COVID, obviously a lot of things got shut down, but um, you know, you have this young artist come to you and go, yeah, I, I, I really like to start writing songs. Um, and, you know, similar to me, full of ideas, you know, and um, yeah, so um, during COVID, uh, you know, we spent some time writing some songs. And uh, again, the co-writing process is really amazing in that. And I firmly believe in it because, you know, we both we, we both had a had a song almost completely written, the two of us. And you hit that spot where you're like, I just it's just not clicking. Right. I know. Hey, uh, Eric Neifel, could you you available for a right? He goes, yeah, I got nothing going on. Pops in rewrite some stuff and you now we have a song that's going to be her first single so you know the songwriting process and for her it's cool seeing her process as a very new writer you know a lot of people always i feel like everyone worries about what their process is right or wrong and there's no such thing as the way there's only a way and for her it's she journals like crazy um you know it, it's like which is a great thing i recommend journaling write down those ideas because we end up writing a song out of three lines she wrote in a journal of how she was feeling one night, you know, and uh, I've written, so I've gone in the rights going, Hey, I wrote this down yesterday because somebody cut me off in traffic and that's how I felt. And we ended up writing a song about that, you know? So you just never know. Um, but yeah, that's been a pretty cool journey. And, you know, she's just growing as a writer and, and I'm excited for what the future holds for her as a writer and an artist as well. I'm hoping our uh, audience is picking up on these great ideas of, of finding those moments um, and writing them down so you can use them again another time. Um, but I just wanted to remind those who are viewing right now, we are the GMI Hub. We are doing a great live interview right now. We're going to be rebroadcasting or putting it up on our YouTube channel, GMI Hub on YouTube. Please check it out. There's a few other videos there that we have in our library. We'd love to, to let you guys be aware of that and see. It's a great resource. We have songwriters. We have um, producers we have re recording artists and we have uh, 
plethora of, I was going to say tool time. I keep calling it Studio tool. talk. <laughs> studio talk. And studio talk is, I keep calling it tool time. I don't know why. But, but studio talk is incredible because we get to talk to engineers and producers who actually work in the industry, in the recording industry, and they have recommendations for gear and microphones. And I tell you, it's a great resource. So please take the time to go to our YouTube channel and check it out for yourself. And don't forget that even in, as you're watching right now, this is not a private session. Go ahead and share this experience because you're going to learn a lot from these guys. I mean, they have written, I mean, somebody, people are staying up after midnight, make it worth their while and share the experience. <laughs> I was from Nashville. Okay, Tom Golly, all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. And then we got Ken Roy Williams, uh, Ken Roy Williams from Toronto. And of course, all the way from County Antrim, Northern Ireland is Edwin Brown. And these three gentlemen are, uh, songwriters and they're just giving us their two cents on what they do and to get the, the songs that they put together and hopefully that'll help equip you to write songs as well. We have an, a question from the audience um, and it's back to Tom um, asking do you co-write with the same people all the time? Uh, I do not. Um, I will say lately I've been I've been writing with Jennifer a lot um, so she's kind of been like you know like kind of like Robin to the to my Batman lately, but um, mainly because I'm trying to uh, help her foster relationships with other writers so that you know they can go off and write way better songs without me ruining it. So that's kind of the goal. But no, I I'll, I'll essentially write with anyone I feel like I'm supposed to write with, or I really feel like is that missing ingredient? Because what I find is like I, I'm kind of an ideas guy and what they call an editor. I'm very good at going like, um, hey, so you know, what if we, you know, are like, are we really conveying the right thing here? Because we're saying this in the chorus and this in the verse. I'm very good at that. So if I bring another person like that into the audit, in, into the, into the fray, we end up editing the heck out of something and never creating it. So I always try to find someone who's very good, um, you know, musically, uh, you're musically inclined on an instrument. I always try to bring in someone who's a pro prolific lyric writer or a melody person and just try to, you know, have all those different strengths, you know? Um, so that's essentially what I look for. I mean, um, and, and, you know, that, that's just really it. It's um, to me at the end of the day though, um, you know, I, I love writing with as many different people as I can, because, you know, if, if you bring vulnerability into a write, you, you sometimes go in as strangers and you leave the best of friends because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you just, you, you just, Laid, you laid it all out there so you know yeah i mean i write with a lot of different people i do have some of my favorite people i'll write with more often than others maybe but um you know that there's no real rhyme or reason for that now you, you mentioned about verse and chorus and well you didn't say bridge but i'm gonna i'm gonna throw this out i've seen there's a, there's always a pattern seemingly with songs there's a verse there's a chorus sometimes a pre-chorus or is it a pre-chorus um and there's a bridge and that kind of thing. Can you, this may sound rudimentary, but what is the purpose of all of that? What is the purpose of a verse compared to a chorus, compared to a pre-chorus, compared to a bridge? Like, what is that? Can you, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Uh, maybe you guys will give you some inspiration to think about when we're doing comedy, like you do stand up comedy, you do a setup for the punchline. So that's kind of when I break down a song, I look at that, those sections as like the pre-chorus, the setup for the chorus. But maybe you have some um, some thoughts on that, guys. Um, I think I think for me, it's it's quite an interesting question. Um, I think what you're trying to convey to to the audience should be the chorus, the message that you're you're trying to convey, so that when they walk away. Uh, the chorus is really in their heads. The message is in their heads. So for me, whatever I'm trying, whatever the message is, I try to convey that in the chorus. Um, one of the songs I wrote was, was a hymn, because I write hymns as well, which are, are sung in traditional churches over here, uh, as well as evangelical churches. But one of the hymns that I, that I wrote uh, called Christ for Me uh, was really based on a sermon that I heard. Uh, uh, and Dale will, will know the pastor, Pastor Taylor, very well. Uh, and it was about, if I could just say very briefly, it was about uh, Emperor Nero, who in the early Roman church uh, slaughtered and killed lots of, of the early Christians. And as those Christians uh, were taken out to Colosseums to be, you know, 
ravaged by wild animals as a, fo a form of sport. Um, all they had to do was be lined up to go into the Colosseum to their death was to approach a flame and they would place incense on it. And by doing so, they were set free. So that inspired me to write a hymn called Christ for Me. And the chorus, the lyrics go, O bleeding lamb of Calvary, who gave his life for me, for no one else could set me free, Christ for me. Very simple. So that was the message I was trying to convey in the song, mm -hmm. that only Christ can set us free. Uh, and so the, the verses are slightly different. I think the verses lead into the chorus. Uh, they can tell a story. They can, they can, uh, the, 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 you try and make them relative to the chorus, but um, you can be quite reflective in the verses. Um, but the bridge, that's a good question. For me, and I have to be honest, for me, the bridge musically does something different. So the, the verse, the structure of the verses melodically will be the same. The structure of the chorus will be the same. But when I go to the bridge uh, musically, it will be something different. And usually for me, the bridge is something that soars musically. So um, for me, it's taking the song slightly in a different, um, up to a different level of joy or sorrow or whatever the message happens to be. That's me being honest, but it's a, a, Tom and Kieran probably have different um, experiences with the bridge. I think you're probably similar, your thoughts are similar to mine. My, my verses are the journey to the chorus. Um, what's, what, what is the initial thought I want you to have leading up to the message I'm trying to convey in the chorus? And then for the bridge, I, I usually write it a bit differently as well. So it's usually, I think about that as the listener's response to what they've heard. And I try to dig from that place. Okay, now that I've taken you on this journey, you've gotten the message. What do I expect your response internally to be? And then I try to write the bridge from that perspective. Um, sometimes it's it, sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's more okay. Now that we've set the stage, what is another thought that could be from this whole experience that I want to bring? You know, I want to bring into the picture that would maybe lead me back to my chorus at some point, or yeah. to something else special that is going to be set up. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, and and you know, not every song needs a bridge. I find in my writing style. Often, if we're, um, you know, if we've gotten to where we got three verses, we usually just kind of don't need it. Usually, mm -hmm. you, know, mu you know, musically in my head, if we have three verses, we usually kind of find a down, a play, like an odd place for a down chorus to kind of bring things to a halt, but stay on on target. Whereas, you know, it, sometimes you just sort of run out of like everything's been said already. Right. And so sometimes that bridge can just sort of, you know, I, I love using bridges as a way to sort of summarize everything we just said, you know, um, yeah. you know, and, and it's, you know, like if you just have this whole song about not being shaken, but you never actually say the words, I'll, I won't be shaken. And mm -hmm. then now your bridge becomes this chant of, I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken because, and then your chorus is this, it's like, Oh, okay. Like you said, it, it, it's like a launch, you know, but I've also done the weird thing where I've written like my last single, we didn't write a bridge. Um, I mean, we, well, to be fair, we did write a bridge, but it, it kind of just feels like another verse musically. Um, but it feels like the bridge is just this very instrumental part that kind of dies down and we kind of tag the title of the song like two or three times in it. And like, so sometimes it's like, you know, I just feel like when you think about a bridge, I, I often get to a point in a right where I'm like, well, what does this song need? Because sometimes it doesn't need a bridge. Mm -hmm. There's no need for it. And then, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like if you're writing for radio these days, it's almost like bridge is unnecessary because now, I mean, radio singles are two minutes and 30 seconds long. You, mm -hmm. you could short a song by quite a bit by just no bridge. Who needs it? And in mm -hmm. Christian, in, in contemporary Christian music, it seems like the more repetitive, the better. So um, it almost, so it really, I think it depends on what your target market is, you know, what exactly you're looking for. I think congregational worship, I think bridges are amazing tools to be used yeah. in that. Um, I think if you're going for radio, you should be mindful of the song length and, you know, but ultimately, you know, I just always err on the side of what is gonna, what is gonna benefit the song? 
because it's mm -hmm. about the song. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, it doesn't matter how pretty the voice is, how handsome the singer is, or how beautiful the singer is. What matters is the message and the song, and does it hit? Does it make someone feel what you're trying to feel, or does it make someone understand what you're trying to say? If it does that, whether it needs a bridge to do that or not is subjective. And that's why I love co-writing because I've been in plenty mm -hmm. of arguments on whether we need a bridge or not. So <laughs> it sounds like to me, Tom, you like arranging songs. You like to take them and put them together and-, and Well, sure. I mean, I, I, as an artist, because I mean, I, I don't write, I don't write to pitch songs. I don't write to, uh, I mean, I, I have had opportunity, but I haven't done it much. Um, where I, I have written for the church, you know, a church I've been part of, like, we have something going on in the church and like we really want to write a song to speak to that i have done that but often i am writing for me or even if i'm writing with another artist for them we are thinking of what they could do in the production end of it it's it's not necessary to do and i don't recommend everyone think that way but i often and again this might sound crazy to some but i'm also a bit of a visual artist so i imagine if i'm writing this song i need to imagine myself on a stage singing it oh my goodness you know, and I even I even sometimes feel like I even imagine like, OK, well, like, can I imagine the lighting, like what the lighting would do on a song like this? Can I craft an experience around these words, around this melody, around this arrangement? Because to me, um, you know, the, I've 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 done it. I've recorded songs that when I when I got up on a stage to play it, none of that worked. And I'm like, <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have recorded this. So I try to keep those things in mind. But at the end of the day, what matters more than anything is just, you know, you find, you find your voice, your message voice in your songs. And I think once you find your stride, you know what impacts people. Uh, much Whether you're doing comedy or you're a, a chef, you know what ingredients you need to, to hit, hit people where it matters. And, you know, so everyone's process is different. Can I just uh, say, make two points here? One, I'm not crazy. Um, you talked about <laughs> imagining yourself on a stage. I do that a lot when I'm writing for other artists. I, I don't want to. It's going to sound a bit weird, but I almost imagine that I'm them on stage, and what do I want to say? And that's why I always have a conversation with them. Try to pick their brain. Where are they at? What's moving them? What's happening? What's their experience? What do they want to sing about? What? You know, I, I want to draw from their experience and then use that on the stage to deliver a song. Um, so thank you for saying that, Tom. I, I, I finally have peace with internal. <laughs> you're not crazy. <laughs> Somebody else is crazy. It doesn't mean you're not crazy. So, oh, okay. so, <laughs> so with, with, with that said, it might be tough to, for you to write for Jennifer Lopez because you'd have to imagine yourself doing all that dancing. <laughs> I just don't know if I can write and think about myself dancing on a stage. I don't know if I have that capacity. So more power to you on that. The I, second point I wanted to make was about the bridge. And um, when you're writing for choirs, oh, that's to the earth. When you're writing for choirs, um, it, there's this cool thing that happens in, in, in gospel choirs where you get to do what's called a vamp. So it, sometimes you take an idea and you write it out. <laughs> so it, it, a lot of repeating. Or you take an idea and you get to build um, different sections of the choir, um, giving almost giving their own perspective on where they are in the journey. And um, that's, that's how I look at the vamp anyway. And so you get to do this cool thing where you play with the different parts, you play with different words, more lyrics than you would for, let's say, a soloist or maybe a smaller group. And then sometimes that's the opening, literally a bridge into a whole new section of thought or experience on the same topic, so, or so, it leads uh, you along the path to something else. But Kenroy, so we're talking about corporate worship, and this is choir application. I know that mm -hmm. Edwin and you both have written for choirs. Now, as a corporate worship leader, it, it, what, what kind of tools would you come into, or what kind of uh, way would you approach a choir piece, thinking about your you got your tenors, your baritones, your sopranos, and you're trying to figure that arrangement in the writing. How does that change your mindset? For me, I, I think it keeps it more familiar. Uh, if, if you're looking at corporate worship, I think back to Edwin's point, um, 
more simple lyrics, more simple harmonies maybe at spots where you're wanting people to join in and sing with you uh, so that it communicates exactly what you want it to do, to, to say at that point and to actually get people involved. So that would be maybe a different perspective on it versus writing a production piece or a piece that you're expecting people to have more of an experience but not necessarily sing with you. So again, it's back to what you're looking you, you want to always communicate a message, but you also want to understand what you're looking to accomplish with the entire piece. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And also I find that with choirs, uh, I always have to be mindful that not everyone in the choir reads music or reads notation. Uh, so therefore, for me, I try and inspire people by, uh, um, by choosing songs that are uplifting. Um, and it's okay to have songs you mentioned, soprano, alto, also tenor and bass, we call it SATB. But not all songs need that. Some, some of the greatest right. songs that we can, we can sing are pure units and that is they all sing the melody line. So it depends on the choir you're working uh, with, but certainly I think songs that, that you can communicate to a choir through allowing them to hear it and teaching them, teaching them the song. We call it over here in Ireland by root. I don't know if that's an international term. Yes. Teaching by root. In other words, you sit down at the piano and you, you sing the song to the choir or rather than, than reaching them a whole bunch of uh, notes, of whole notes and quavers and half notes that they can't understand, but songs that, that are accessible to choirs um, to learn easily, songs that are uplifting, songs that have a powerful message, songs that inspire the audience mm -hmm. as well as the choir, songs that reflect this, this whole thing about authenticity, real life songs that reflect where we are in relation to god and our walk with god and songs that just make us feel good with good rhythm uh good structure uh so again it just depends on on the choirs i've worked with school choirs i've worked with uh, mass choirs community choirs and uh, all of them um they all require certain different aspects of of notation. Some need music in front of them because they, they sight read others, they don't sight read any. So it just depends on the requirements. But as a solo artist, it's a totally different maybe concept to writing your original material. Uh, like, like Edwin and I have actually written a song together many years ago. But it's, it's just, it's, I know that there's, there's a different way of maybe when it comes to a choir or a, or a congregational worship or a, a personal song. Your approach is probably different. Um, Thanks, Bob. <laughs> um, I mean, everything that they said to me, uh, I, I would, I would say it, it, it's the same but different. Um, I mean, because ultimately, you know, for me as a solo artist, um, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, you, you hope that you're going to write a song or or produce a song or sing a song that, you know, every person in attendance is going to want to sing with you. So that <laughs> becomes you, you know, you almost want to become a choir director. And um, it's it, it's interesting. I, I found that um, that's one of the most that's one of my most favorite things about leading worship is even if I didn't write the songs, it's hearing all of those amazing voices that are in the congregation singing mm -hmm. all for the glory yeah. of our Creator. Um, you know, so I, I would say it's the only difference is I'm not writing a song with you know, tenor parts and, you know, all those things. But what I am writing is with the idea that, you know, everyone, everyone in the room will be singing with us, mm -hmm. you know? And then of course there's those songs where you're like, I hope no one sings. I hope they just receive this. Let mm -hmm. me sing this over them. You know, mm -hmm. um, that's actually one of the funniest things that's ever happened to me was I asked people not to sing, just let us sing this over <laughs> them. And I, they were like, Nope, <laughs> they sang with us louder. It was like, okay. But uh, ultimately, you know, I, again, I, I think that in songwriting, no matter the genre, I mean, I don't even care if you're talking about rap. I think it's the, it's the same but different. That is so cool. I'm also going to uh, just going to remind everybody, you are listening right now to GMI Hub Online. We are talking about songwriting, lyric writing. we got three amazing panelists. We have Keyroy Williams from Toronto, Toronto Mass Choir. We have Edwin Brown all the way from Northern Ireland. And we have Tom Golly from Nashville joining us and talking to us about songwriting, specifically lyric writing.
And this is not a private conversation, guys. So go ahead, share this experience and know that we are actually recording this and we're going to put this on our YouTube channel as well. So if you, even if you can't stay with us, share the experience and come back and watch it on, on our YouTube channel, GMI Hub Online. We look forward to seeing you there. And if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Or if you just want to just give props and thumbs up to our panelists, do that. Put it in the chat. Encourage these guys because they are sacrificing their time to be with you. We have some questions from the audience, and I would like to um, ask those questions now. Um, one question is, how does the, we were talking about bridges and so forth, but how does the oohs, ahs, and oh, oh, oh's and all that fit into a, a song as well? Heroi, you deal with choirs. Talk to us. Well, I think maybe that speaks more to the vocal arrangement and what's required. Sometimes a choir does need to um, sound off with words, but then there are times where to create the experience or the feeling that you're looking for, then those ahs need to, to 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 be supportive of maybe the soloist or supporting the music that's happening um, to create the experience or or um, to, to bring them along on this journey that we're going on. So I think that's how it fits in. It it has to be right <laughs> um, for sure to 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 con convey the feeling and the expression of the music. But um, you know sometimes they're just as powerful as actually saying the words. Um, so that's my Ed, take on. Edwin, do you ever use oohs and ahs in your music? Do you know, I, um, I've heard the guys, because I did some homework before I came on air, and I listened to Tom and, and, and Kawhi, fabulous singers. Um, I think sometimes if you've got good singers like these guys are, um, there is scope sometimes for a bit of ad lib. Um, I find sometimes, again, depending on the choir, they need to know exactly where the ooh and as are because it can be quite rigid, unless you've got a fabulous choir like Kerois where they feel the beat, feel the rhythm. Um, sometimes some of the choirs I've worked with, they need to know exactly where the as and the oohs are. Is it on the downbeat, is it on the upbeat? Uh, but certainly there is scope for it because when we start writing these songs and performing these songs, something happens in the spiritual realm that we have to be mindful of. And we're in a spiritual realm, so we have to be able to be, be flexible that if we go into a really spiritual uh, dimension that we have the, the freedom to allow people whether it's scripted or not to do oohs and ahs uh, so it just really depends on the choir and the moment that we're in I think it of course has its place because let's let's be real what are songs really I would I would think songs are emotions they're, they're and often songs are putting lyrics and words we're translating what people are feeling sometimes as a songwriter that's hopefully what you're doing hopefully you're giving somebody um, something to connect to there you know and now again maybe maybe not necessarily a worship song but let's say you're just writing a song in general with a message my hope as a songwriter is they go oh, me too me too mm -hmm. i get that so mm -hmm. you know and let's be real i mean you know like when, when i got when i got my first water baptism i mean i came out of the water and i was just like "Woo! that's not a lyric that's a feeling <laughs> Yeah, you know, just yeah. like if you're really into a moment, you know, whoa, whoa, you know, it's like that's it. You're conveying an emotion with it. It's you know, some people knock it. They go, oh, it's not lyrics. It, it's meaningless. No, it's a, you're conveying an emotion. Yeah. You know, and, and a great use of non-lyrical, um, and another great use of like non-lyrical. I don't even know what the real term for like O's and woes and things like that are, but there's a Toby Mac song called "When Love Broke Through." Mm -hmm. and he uses like or whoever wrote that song i'm not sure who wrote that one exactly but you know there, for instance like in the verses it's like i did all that i could to undo me but your love but you love me enough to pursue me mm -hmm. that's it it's not <laughs> lyrics it's a sound mm -hmm. and you know if that's what makes that song take those mm -hmm's away those verses don't impact you the same way just like there's, you know, plenty of songs that, you know, like it, some of my, one of my, my most recent songs where, you know, we sing, I'm letting go. It's like, I'm letting go. Oh, oh, oh. it's like, it's just conveying the freedom that, you know, there is found in letting go and trusting God. So it's about the motions, I, I believe. 
And, um, you know, I know some people, again, some people knock it. They say it's cheating or whatever. But I just think if you're conveying a feeling and a message, have at it. Some people say it's a hook. Um, I, I think of, uh, well, I think of my husband who loves to listen to music and the music that he gets excited about are the ones that have the O's, you know, or the Oz or anything that that's easy to grab onto that he can kind of just jump up and down and kind of pump fist or whatever. And, and like you said, it may be just a conveying an emotion that he can hop on and go, yes, I can relate to that too. So I don't know, he's just one person, but there are probably many others that feel the same way, which is, is interesting. That's kind of cool. That is kind of cool. So another question that it came up is, um, wow, there's a few. Uh, what technique is utilized to keep a listener hooked for the whole song? <laughs> Speaking of hooks, <laughs> what technique do you use in your songs uh, that you've written um, to keep people hooked to the whole song? Edwin, you're hmm. quiet. You're smiling. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, it's funny how when, we, when I write songs, I don't really... Uh, analyze a lot of what's been asked and it's, it's, I find it very interesting. I always find in the chorus a very strong um, strong melody um, uh, or s something that keeps people interested, maybe a chord that's unexpected thrown in there. So musically there might be something there that I might do. I'm not aware of it you know, at, the, at the moment or sometimes lyrically we can we can look at the song from a different perspective, uh, which can make it interesting for the listener to, 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 to learn or to sing. So it's a good question. I think both the, the lyrics, something that um, maybe a bit ambiguous, uh, you know, in its, in, its, in its form, or something uh, in the melody line or the, the musical uh, structure that is interesting for them. Yeah, keeping it simple, always keeping it simple. Okay, keeping it simple. Kiro, Kiroi, how do you, uh, when you're writing songs, whether it's for yourself, for the choir, or for another individual, how do you promote or how do you encourage, I guess, the listener, or uh, writing the song so that the listener is hooked to the whole song? Is there one particular method or? I think um, building on what Edwin said, I think every, you're going to find that you have different types of listeners. Some are musicians, and so they're going to hear every chord progression. They're going to hear those um, little neat tricks that musicians do to, to get their bandmates going. Um, if you have singers, they're going to probably listen for... I know I like to hear cool little things that, I, I, you know, that were a bit unexpected sometimes. Uh, and then as a consumer, sometimes you, it's, it's just about the experience of the lyric. Is it truthful? Is it speaking to a truth that I can, that resonates with me? Um, does, does the experience um, pull me in? So it may depend on who's listening, um, but I think you're going to have a gambit of, you know, people who draw different things from the song, depending on what their interest is, who they are, what they're looking for at the time, what, you know, what, what just sticks with them. Cool. So, Tom, how do you keep them hooked? Um, you tell them know, to I let think, go. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on the. I depend. Think it depends on the song and the style. There's a lot of things. You know, I. I think the way I would approach, you know, a, a pop hook is different than how I would approach a, a congregational worship hook. Yeah. Um, but I feel like you know you, you can't ever go wrong by just following simple. Keep it simple, singable, and relatable. Um, but for me, I love, the, you know, I, to add the big F to that is fun. Is this fun to sing? I mean, it, think about there isn't a single, I can't find a single hit song ever that isn't fun to sing. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, right off the head, top of my head, I, for, I don't know what it is. But there's just something really fun about singing Carry On My Wayward Son in the car. You know, there's something really fun about singing 10,000 Reasons. There's just something. And it's maybe sometimes it's not fun, but maybe maybe it's just cathartic. Maybe you mm -hmm. sing it and you feel better, so you want to sing it again. You know, um, I mean, and, and it just that's the bottom line is like, how do you feel when you sing it? Do you feel good? Or if, you know, or maybe it, it calms you down or maybe it. it 
if it really just to for me is does it make me feel a feeling that i want to feel again mm. over and over and over again in a four minute or a three minute period ah uh, yeah <laughs> so that's kind of where i'm at is with you know and not all songs need to have a hook i mm -hmm. mean it also depends on what you're going for um you know for instance if i'm writing a song for a funeral i don't know that a hook is the answer um you know because I, I but i think that if you're writing a song that you want people to sing with you you want people to dance you want people to go hey let's play that a second or third time in a row you're probably going to get more people to like your song with a hook so um you know and and again it's just um i again i also think it, again it circles back to the type of song it is where some songs are stories and it's interesting mm -hmm. where some songs are written so well where even though the chorus is a hook after each verse that chorus means something different so like that's the so again that's the that's the kind of song i'm dying to write mm. is where every time you hit that chorus it's the same words but boy are you in a different place right now that no. is that is something that i long for but you know um so i hope that answers the question <laughs> I think it does. Well, someone someone now just typed in. So, what's the different? What's an example of a pop hook versus a, a worship hook, or what would be the difference between those type of hooks? Is what someone just wrote. So, okay, I don't know if you're able to give an example or. Well, I mean, uh, shoot. Um, I mean, a pop hook can simply just be like, you know, um, I got a feeling tonight's gonna be a good good night tonight. Like that's a pop hook. What's it saying? Tonight's gonna be a good night. Cool, but a worship hook. Well, you better have some something theologically right in there. You better have something that points to the Creator. Um, you know, you better have something in there that truly is gives glory to God. I, when I write a worship song, I don't want to sing that tonight's gonna be a great worship night. Like that's not my hook at all. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think that they're going to sing any of the songs that we write in heaven, but, you know, I like to put myself, uh, I like to put myself at a place of where these words have way more gravity and more importance uh, in this setting than something that's going to entertain or just have some fun. Well, um, you have to know your demographic, you know, your audience. Yeah, and not to say that pop songs can't be worship songs. Of course they can. But mm -hmm. I, I would say that, like, that's the comparison I would make. Not that it's always fitting, but uh, I, I th that's that's how I would answer that question again. And anyone who's watching realize this: we're get, we get asked questions, and we're just like, what we're doing is we're songwriting by me giving you answers because we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> if we're well, being honest, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I, it is interesting because you you write when you're writing, you're not thinking about all of these no. things, right? You're not thinking about you know, um, is it, ca you know, I mean, it, at some point you want to analyze it a bit, but you're really not thinking about all these factors or things happening. You are really on the, the writer's experience. You're, you're on that experience and on that journey of the song with it to see, okay, where are we going? Well, where is it going to end up? Well, what's going to happen? So the analogy is when you a painter on a canvas, they're, they're putting the brush strokes on and they probably are not where they want to be, but they know each time they add a brush stroke, they're getting closer, you know? Yeah, I, th I think it's important that uh, Kiroi is right. I, I don't really think about it, but one thing I am conscious of when I'm writing worship songs, and, and Tom mentioned it there, I think there is a certain protocol that we have to be aware of, you know, that worship is something much more meaningful, deeper than a praise song, for example. So if we sing a praise song, which is usually upbeat, up-tempo, you know, a song of Thanksgiving, um, the hooks for that type of song, that style of song, will be very different uh, from a worship song, which, which comes from the spirit, um, and which is much more about the attitude of our heart. So right. the protocol for writing worship songs as opposed to praise songs, uh, we take that protocol from um, the tabernacle of Moses, the Holies of Holies, the outer, outer area where the, the Thanksgiving took place. But as the high priest went into the Holies of Holies, into the, into the, into the middle uh, to worship, it was a completely different experience. So those are the types of things I would be a bit more sensitive to when it comes to writing praise and worship songs. Uh, worship is all about who he is. 
uh, less about my experiences and what I'm feeling and what's going on in my life. And worship doesn't reflect that. So um, that's probably the only thing that I would be conscious of. But as Kerwa says, I don't really think too much about anything else. I just sit down and I, I just lift the pen or I sit at the keyboard and I just, I just feel inspired by something I've heard. Or also, people that inspired me when I when I grew up. Don't be afraid to to listen to other people. Mm -hmm. I loved Andre Crouch when I grew up. I love people like Keith Green when I grew up and and listen to these artists. I loved what they had to say, what they had to sing. Uh, and that really, really encouraged me as well. So there is no real prescriptive way to do this. It's all about uh, doing it, just going for it, just going for it and starting process. And honestly, um, you'll be amazed at how much you can, you can create just through uh, something someone said or a verse from the Bible or, or an expression that we use or something you heard in a sermon. Just get it on paper mm -hmm. or sit down with your instrument and play a few bars, pull around, uh, and you'll be amazed at what can forward. Because I believe the Holy Spirit's in this mix as well. And he'll yes. inspire you uh, to be creative. It's, uh, being creative is, is something God has given us a gift to be. We're all called to be creative to some degree. We, we can't all sing, we can't all play instruments, but we can all be creative and, uh, and do different things. But songwriting is so important to uh, and expressing how we feel, the experience of, of how we relate to God and, and all of these things. So my, my advice is just just do it, just start and do it. I think that's been an ongoing uh, encouragement from anybody who's been on our panel to talk about writing, just do it, just do it. And the more you do it, the better it will get, the easier it will come. And so, so I just wanna quickly just tell everybody, thank you for joining us. We've got um, Tom Golly, uh, Kerroy Williams and Edwin Brown, three amazing writers, uh, talking about music, talking about writing songs today. And so we hope you can glean something from this and be inspired to help you with your songwriting today. Also, we want to encourage you to, uh, to share this experience because we do uh, upload these videos up onto our YouTube channel uh, on GMI Hub. And we want you to get a chance to really share this experience with people who you might think appreciate, uh, might appreciate this and uh, the amazing talent that we have on all of our shows. And so uh, it'd be a great resource for you and your friends uh, that you may know who are in the musical industry. And we'd just like you to be aware. Let's see, I like something Edwin just mentioned about the protocols and how he described our expression of worship. And it, uh, I was just thinking how it's funny that when we are connected with God and we're really writing from that place of worship, that the worship songs that come out they automatically fold into those protocols because we are in that space. We're in that place. That's where we're writing from. It, it's the, the words, the lyrics, the expression, the experience is one of worship. So it, how it, it just aligns with the protocols for worship. When, when we write from that place of truth and I, and uh, for me, it's always writing from a place of truth, whether it's my experience, somebody else's experience, or whatever it is, I try to write something that's truthful to the word. When you hear it, it, it should it, it should resonate inside because it is either a li it's a lived experience of some kind. Amen. That was my thought. Yeah, yeah. There is, I, I'm looking at the time and I have so many questions I want to ask, you know. Um, one that I, I it was a question that was received kind of off before we even came on, on air, and actually many weeks ago, where people are interested in knowing the stories behind the songs that you write. So they'll pick a song and they'll say, what were you thinking when you were actually writing this song? So, like, for example, Tom, you just talked about the song, I'm Letting Go. And, you know, I know I've mentioned a few other ones that I, I wrote down too, like His Name is Jesus and um, Fighting for Us. And I know there are some other songs that I've, I've heard, but I've not heard too, like, too much of. Uh, and I was like, what, what journey did you go through when you were writing these songs? Mm. Well, you know, um, it's interesting that you say that because almost every song I write, I at some point hit a moment where I go, what was I thinking? <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, I mean, I, I wish that I all the time had a very profound answer 
for that, you know, I went through this horrible thing or I went through this awesome thing and had a song. Sometimes it's just as simple as, again, because I only co-write. So I have been part of rights where maybe a song I've written or recorded had nothing to do with me. I just got to, I got to help craft the idea. For argument's sake, Jennifer Chamberlain's um, upcoming single, it's called I Give It All to You. And that song literally came right out of her journal. Um, you know, um, and, and, you know, we just, I was part of crafting that song, you know, it, it, in a way that she would want to sing, you know, and, uh, then there's songs like, uh, one of my songs, Keep Fighting was a song that, uh, I wrote with, uh, I co-wrote that with a uh, former American Idol, Chris Sly, an incredible songwriter, um, and, uh, just a great friend of mine, you know, and, and I had a lot going on around me. Um, I had a friend, I had two friends dealing with serious marriage problems. Um, you know, my, um, two of my brothers were having marriage problems, you know, uh, to the point of, you know, there was some, some, some potential suicide attempts that were taking place. And I kind of went into a right, we were talking about it. And, you know, I come from a family where, you know, we're, I'm, I'm essentially the only practicing Christian at, at, in, in the entire family. So I'm the weird one, you know? So um, we kind of got to a point of like, before, before we, we talked about the right, it was like, Hey, um, you know, he, Chris Sly had asked me, he said, so like, if you were like, if you were able to be there in those moments, you know, where they were at their lowest, what would you say? And I'm like, well, I couldn't directly just be like, God loves you. Like they wouldn't receive that right away. Like, what would I say? I'd tell him, well, keep fighting. You're not alone. And of course, you know, any good co-writer starts typing or writing down what you're saying. And, you know, essentially this song is everything I would say to them in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, you know, and, and, and what I find is the way we crafted the song is very much like when you build a relationship with someone who's not a believer, you kind of go slow. You take it easy with how much God you, you hit them with. You know, you take it real slow. And as the song goes on, we get more and more deeper in how loved they are by the king of the, like, we, we, you know, we reference God by saying that if the king of the world found you worthy of love and worthy of dying for, then your life is a life that's worth fighting for. And that came from my point of like, why don't people realize how loved they are that if Jesus himself would get on a cross so that you can have eternal life, why don't you realize that your life is significant and your life matters? You know, so that's what, you know, and that's essentially the message we're conveying with those lyrics, um, you know, and, and it, it's essentially, uh, you know, and that's where we say in, in the song, he is faithful. He'll hold on to you. So hold on. And um, so, I mean, again, it, it's, that's really what that song was, was a message to people imagining, well, this is, this is, if I was right there in that moment, what would I say to them? And the interesting thing I found, and this was advice given by Benji Cowart, who if you've hit, listened to anything by Big Daddy Weave lately, that's a hit. Uh, Benji's behind it. But he gave advice once and said that if you write with many people in mind, you'll c probably connect with few. But if you write with few people in mind, you'll probably connect with many. And mm -hmm. that song and the success that I've had with it um, has really proven that to be 100% true. Uh, you know, if you write, if you try to write a radio hit because you think everyone's going to love this, it's probably not going to hit the same. So, you know, um, you know, and then songs like I'm Letting Go just came from me hitting a wall in life. We're just going, you know, I'm trying to control everything. I'm trying to control my music career. I'm trying to make everything fit this, this, this exact image that I have in mind for what it should look like. And I'm stressed out all the time. I'm tired. I'm upset. Uh, I feel trapped. Uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling and fighting for control that I don't need to have because God's in control mm -hmm. and he's way better at steering the ship than I ever will. So the song was just about celebrating the freedom. See, I, you know, I, I sometimes get lost in the macho of like, I got this, I got this, I got this God, don't no worry, <laughs> I'll let you know. You know, when really there should be a freedom in being like, I don't, I don't got this because he does. I'm right. letting go, I'm free. So that was sort of the, um, 
that was essentially the idea. And, you know, we go to the bridge to explain it all. Each battle I face, you've already won. I'll never be less than the work that you've done. You hold my future. Let go of my past. You're fin- um, wow, I don't remember my own words. Uh, you're, you'll finish what you've begun because I'm letting go. And it's mm-hmm. just resting in that faith. And so, I mean, you don't always have to go through a traumatic experience. It could just be as something as simple as like, this is what I'm feeling lately. And I feel like maybe people need to hear that for me as an artist because people have this idea that because I get on stage I got it all together I got it figured out I have all the answers and they don't know that I'm just as lost as you it's just God decided to go hey dude get on the stage and tell people that oh okay (laughs) so that's that's my story on, on just those songs but I mean I'm sure these guys have way better stories than me well Edwin did speak a little bit about Christ for me didn't you Edwin um yeah, I mean, um, I just um, just back up what Tom's been saying. Uh, but for me, as as uh, as far as Christ for me was concerned, um, it was inspired by a sermon. And I think subconsciously, I was um, I went to bed that particular Sunday night after the sermon, and about three o'clock in the morning, I I could hear the melody line. I could I could get some kind of lyrics in my head. Another great tip is the fact that most of us have got iPhones now or Androids where we can pick up our phone and sing a melody that comes into our heads because that's sometimes mm-hmm. one of the best things we can do. We don't always have to run to a piano or a keyboard to stuff up your phone. And I, I sang the chorus, the melody uh, into the phone. And I literally, you know, uh, had the melody of the chorus inside a few minutes. And that song was inspired by something that I'd heard in church that was when the, the early Christians were set free, when they placed the incense on top of the candles, they renounced uh, Christianity, and none of them did. None of them did. They all walked through uh, to their deaths, you know, and uh, that really spoke to me. Uh, 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 so, yeah, I think songwriting is an extension of how we are feeling. Sometimes we, we are not aware how we feel. It's, it's a subconscious thing. Uh, and when we go to bed, we have we can be wakened uh, in our sleep and uh, things can inspire us that we heard or that someone said. So again, I don't think there's a prescriptive way. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of my songs have been, some of them have been, been written as I've been leading worship. The Bible talks about psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, mm-hmm. songs that, that I hadn't planned, songs that weren't, um, that I'd ever written down, just melody lines that would come to me in free worship or uh, melody lines that would come to me. Uh, songs like Grace, Grace, Wonderful Grace, which I, which I wrote, which is a very simplistic song. I was inspired just in free worship. Um, I didn't sit down at the piano and decide to write it, it just came. So as being open to the Holy Spirit, I think that's the key as Christians, we need to be open to what God is saying to us, what he's speaking through us, and not, and not being afraid to write things down because sometimes we're our own worst critics We'll write lyrics and we'll go, oh, that's stupid. Oh, that doesn't make sense. And we'll play around with things and we'll scrap things. And we'll... Sometimes just write it down. Trust yourself that what you're writing down is what God is trying to say. And Kiroi, just to, I'll squeeze you in on this. I know you've written many, many songs. And one of the reasons I reached out to you is because someone said, this guy's brilliant when he writes. <laughs> so... Yeah. I, I'll, I'll be honest, I listened to some songs. I just don't know which ones were the songs that you've written. But can you just tell us a song, give us an example of a song you've written, and what exactly were you thinking behind that song? Well, I'll give you two. Um, Anthem of Praise, uh, for, that's for, I wrote that for Toronto Mass Choir. The style of it is gospel for the gospel choir. However, um, there is a particular method of, that we call call and answer which I hadn't heard in anything contemporary for a long time. So, and for a choir. So I thought, I've got to try to write this for a choir. So that's how that came about. And then it's more of a praise jubilant song because, okay, with that, then you have to have a theme where people want to kind of chant and go along with it. So anyway, that that was Anthem of Praise. Um, But another song I wanted to talk about was um, I Worship the King, which is from a Christmas project. And um, oddly enough, Christmas is not one of the seasons I've written a lot for. However, when we were, uh, when the choir was looking to put out, uh, do a Christmas 
um, project, I thought, okay, we, we have so many carols. We have, okay, what else can we say? Or how else can we put this time, this season, the meaning of this all into perspective? And so out of that came um, a gift to you of Goldmer and Franklin frankincense is not enough to honor you so i lay down you know the treasures that you ask of me i give my life to worship you and then talking to tom's point about co-writes um i've had some great ones with karen burke who's a director of um she she seems to be able to take my ideas and then when i'm stuck put something else there to just have it so her bridge is oh lamb of god sacrifice for me the Prince of Peace risen to reign and this whole swelling choir thing that happens and it's it's amazing. But um, so sometimes it's from, it, it, the, the initial thing is more of a style thing or it, it's more of okay, an experience of a particular situation. And then another one, If I Believe from Aileen Lombardo um, was basically a conversation with her about what she was going through, her doubts, all of that. And it came out to, if I believe I can move mountains, if I can believe. Um, so, you know, it, it's really from different perspectives, what's perspectives, what's happening at the time and, um, pulling on those to, to create something that honors God. It's just neat to hear those perspectives. Uh, you guys are really, really awesome. Thank you, uh, for joining us, uh, today on, on the broadcast. It's been a, a real pleasure. And I know that we've just, um, got to the point now where we got some other questions, um, but we have run out of time and I just want to thank Tom Roy and Edwin, you guys have been fabulous. And uh, I know it's like really early in the morning for Edwin now. He's way over in Ireland. So it was, but it was a real pleasure to have each one of you with us. Well, thank you. Good. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And we want to thank you, audience, for being with us. Thank you for tuning in and listening to these wonderful guys share their stories. I pray and hope that you got something out of this and that you did share this experience. Uh, we want to encourage you also to find these guides online. Tom Golly has his music, tomgollymusic.com. Am I correct? Yep, that's correct. And Kiroi, I do. is your music on just the Tarnamass Choir website, or is there another website? tmc.ca. tmc.ca, awesome. And Edwin, do you have a website, or you just go to YouTube? No. Yeah, just go to YouTube and type in my name. And you should, my name's kind of strange, Edwin Brown. Fortunately, there's not too many. So if you, if you take my name in, you should get some of my songs there. Yeah. Excellent. And I pray you all will go there and check those musics out and go and like and subscribe. Support these guys and support us. You know, go to our, go to our channel, like and subscribe our channel. Yeah. But, <laughs> and, um, and ring the bell so that anytime we post something, you will be there. You will be able to get that notification. But for now, we want to say good night. We will be back next week. Um, and we will have actually Karen Burke is going to be one of our panelists <laughs> next week. <laughs> so um, we will definitely, we will be back. We want you to come back next week right here, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. Pacific or midnight in, in England and in Ireland. <laughs> you know, before you, before you guys sign off, I, I, I just feel like I, I, there's two things that I had hoped to say to any uh, aspiring songwriter before, before we sign off. Um, I had hoped to touch on, I didn't really get the chance to, but uh, just two huge pieces of advice that were game changers for me that I heard in like year one of really trying to be a professional artist, songwriter, um, that if had I not heard, um, I think I would still now be like dealing with the problems. But one is um, don't just write when it's when it's inspired. Write until it's inspired. Uh, the great Tony Wood shared that. Uh, if you don't know who he is, he's got over seventy or so number one hits as a songwriter. Um, but that was, was amazing advice. The other thing is hold on loosely. These songs don't belong to you. Mm. And what happens with them? is God's business. So whether you write a song and nothing happens with it, or you write a song and years later, someone else besides you wants to sing it, or someone has an idea that can make it a better song, hold on loosely, let God do what he's gonna do with it because he's in control. Thanks thank for you. sharing that, Tom. Thank you so much. And again, thank you all. Any last words, Kiroi, Edwin, before we sign off? 
listen to your heart, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and don't be afraid to express what you feel the Holy Spirit is saying to you. As crazy as it might be, just mm. write it down. Just start the process. Just write it down. Excellent. Can write, write? write it down, do voice memos. And even if it doesn't make sense right now or it doesn't become a song right now, who's to say in a few years it won't? Um, sometimes there are times where things need time to, to sit uh, to, in order to become. Um, however, take the inspiration down somehow, record it, and, and go from there. Oh, yeah. oh, thank you.